Well, this time children in preschool through kindergarten are dismissed for Children's Church. And as they are leaving, I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 41. I did count the, uh, the little tags left in the basket there. We had three left. So I don't know if we'll have some more to give out or not, but uh, uh, at least 37 up here this morning. What a joy that is. Well, as we come to the word, let us uh, do so in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Father, it is truth. And Lord, we would ask that we would open ourselves to your truth as you unfold it for us through the working of your Holy Spirit. Father, we do ask, as we have asked so often and continue to do so, Father, we would ask that you would open our eyes, that we would see wonderful things in the pages of your word. Father, we ask that you would speak to us. Father, may we be transformed and molded by that which you say. And Father, we ask that you would receive praise in, our, in the responses that we make to you this day. Father, this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this past week, I was, I was trying to re think back to my formative years, early years. I, I was trying to remember my first day of first grade. I can't remember much of kindergarten. Back in the day... I think we may have had six weeks of kindergarten for just a couple of days. The only thing I remember about that is the teacher had us there for about two hours and she made us have nap time. <laughs> I'm sure she needed a break. So I was thinking, trying to think back to my first day of first grade and trying to think what I was thinking and maybe what I was feeling that morning. And honestly, either because my powers of recall or are slipping, or because nothing traumatic happened, really the events of that day are gone. I, I just really don't remember anything about it. But my first, my, but my sister's first day of first grade, I remember that pretty vividly. <laughs> my, my sister, she was three years older than me. And I remember going to take her to school with my mom, and we dropped her off at school, and she didn't want to be there. She cried. She cried hard. She cried ugly. <laughs> she cried long. And I remember leaving, I remember going home with mom, and it's, why do you remember some of these things? But I remember telling mom, I'm sure she stopped crying by now. <laughs> I don't know if I was trying to comfort mom or myself. Now family lore and legend says that it was weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks before she stopped crying every day she went to school in the first grade. She was afraid. School can be frightening. Even the absence of, absence of physical tears, fears can dwell within. And it's not just the unknowns of a new school year that can give birth to fear. Any new experience, if you're anything like me, has the potential to spawn anxiety. Any new circumstance, any new situation, any new activity, boy, that, that can just well up within me and, and, and cause me to be anxious and a little bit fearful. But as, as a child of God, as God's child through faith in Jesus Christ, there, there are often times I need to hear my Heavenly Father say to me, Fear not, Neil. I am with you. Maybe those are words you need to hear as well from, from time to time. 
when you're in a new season of life, new experience of life, new activities, maybe, maybe you need to, to hear your Heavenly Father sort of bend down to you and, and look you in the eyes and feel his hands on your shoulders and, and say, fear not. I am with you. The instruction to fear not was a word and a reminder that God's people in biblical times needed to hear. In Isaiah chapter 41, God makes this very challenge to his people. His people were fearful. God had foretold a time when his people would be taken to captivity into Babylon. He had foretold a time when they would be removed from their homeland. Many of them separated from their families. He foretold a time when the place where they worshipped in Jerusalem, the temple that had been the meeting place with God for generations, they, they were told that that place was going to be destroyed and tore down. It would be a time in which they would feel helpless and alone and abandoned. But though they would feel that way, perhaps, the Lord wanted them to know that this, in fact, wasn't the case. So God spoke to his people these words. You are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not. For I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And if one reminder to do not fear wasn't enough for their minds and hearts to, to be settled in at ease, God, through the prophet, within the following five verses, drops two additional fear nots on them. As though they needed to hear it again and again and again. And again, which leads us here this morning, in, in those times when we are feeling fearful, we need to be reminded of God's presence with his children. To those who have a relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ. We need to hear our Heavenly Father saying to us, whispering in our ears, perhaps screaming in our ears at times, fear not. I am with you. This morning in our text, we know this. I want you to notice with me three things regarding God's constant concern for his people, for his children. Things that I trust will help us to trust and not be afraid. So let's take a look at those three things this morning. First of all, from the text we notice that when fear has us in its grip, we must Remember God's promise to us. You need to remember God's promise. In our text we read, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not, whatever you may think, I have not cast you off. For the first time in the book of Isaiah, God speaks of his servant. A term which is, appears 31 times between chapter 40 and chapter 66 in Isaiah's prophecy. At times, as here, the word servant refers to the nation of Israel, to God's people, who had been set aside by God himself to do God's will and to accomplish his purpose. At other times in those chapters, the word servant speaks specifically of a single individual, the Messiah, who would come to earth to do specifically God's will and accomplish his purpose through the salvation of mankind. As we know in hindsight, that servant, that promised servant, was none other than Jesus. 
Christ. Well, the, the promise that's made here, it reiterates to God's people this very thing. Whatever it looks like, whatever conclusion you may have drawn, remember this. I have chosen you, and I have not cast you off. Honestly, had they simply been looking at their circumstances, they could easily and so very easily have drawn that conclusion, that that is exactly what God had done, that he had cast them aside, he, he had rejected them, that he was finished and through with them. Their exile into Babylon could have been interpreted as God's abandonment of him. They could have said, we're here in Babylon because God has cut us off. And they would have been wrong. The news that uh, came across my Twitter feed this past week was that historian and author David McCullough passed away last Sunday. Are you familiar with David McCullough? Um, I, I've read three of his books, 1776, John Adams, and a biography of President Harry S. Truman. And as things happen... On my book stand, even now, or my, my nightstand, even now, I have another, a fourth book by David McCullough that I'm working through, and it's called, um, what's the title? Mornings on Horseback. It's the story of the Theodore Roosevelt family that gave us our president, Theodore Roosevelt. It's about President Roosevelt's family in early years of his life and things that made him into the man that he ultimately became. Now, I've never known too much about President Roosevelt, except the impression that I've gotten over time is that he was a man's man, right? He was an adventurer. He was a big game hunter in Africa. He was a member of the military, the cavalry, leading the charge in Cuba as one of the Rough Riders, a military action that sort of helped turn the tide of that war. And so I've always thought of him as a man's man. But as I'm reading about him, what I've discovered was that as a young man, as a child, he, he was very sickly and weak. He, he had debilitating bouts of asthma over and over and over again. And not only that, he, he was an awkward and clumsy child. Always tripping over things and always, you know, not at all the picture that I had in my mind's eye. Well, when he was about 13 years of age, there was something that happened to him that transformed everything for him. They discovered that his eyesight was terrible. Of that experience of getting glasses for the first time, he later wrote, they, the, the glasses, opened an entirely new world to me. And David McCullough writes, his range of vision until then had been about 30 feet, perhaps less. Everything beyond 30 feet was simply a blur. Yet neither, he had, yet neither he nor his family had sensed how handicapped he was. And then this is what caught my eye as I was reading last week. President Theodore Roosevelt said, I had no idea how beautiful the world was. I could not see and yet was wholly ignorant that I was not seen. He thought the world that he saw of 30, in those 30 feet around him was all that there was. That, that, that was the whole thing. I could not see, and yet was wholly ignorant that I was not seen. You see, the, the Israelites, they thought they were seen, and what they thought they were seeing was that God had abandoned them. 
They were in captivity. And they could see 30 feet in front of them. And what they concluded, everything beyond that was a blur. But what they thought they were seeing was God's abandonment of them. And so God says, no, 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 no. I am with you. I have chosen you and have not cast you off. If you think I have, you are not seeing clearly. Through God's promise spoken to them, the Israelites began to see with clarity. They began to understand, we are not cast off, we are not abandoned, but we are chosen and loved and cared for by God. So, so the question that I ask myself at times when the fear and anxiety comes my way, you know, how far am I seeing? Is my vision limited to 30 feet in front of me and everything else is a blur? And I think I'm seeing all that there is to see, but God is saying, no, no, no. There is something else beyond the immediate that you need to fix your eyes on. So how's our vision How's our hearing? If you are a child of God and are feeling fear and anxiety, check your vision. Are you seeing God as he really is or as you think he is? Is his voice garbled by your circumstances so that you are failing to hear him looking your, into your eye and saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you. Oh, may God lift our eyes so that we can see beyond the 30 feet of circumstance to his glory and to his love and to his presence. When fear has its grip on us, we need to remember that of God's promises to you, to us. I have chosen you and has not cast you off. But by the second thing we see in this text, when fear has us in its grip, we must remember God's plea. To us. At the beginning of verse 10, God moves from speaking promises to his people to pleading with them. Again, our text You are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. You see, God's pleading with his people is grounded in the promise to his people. I have not rejected you. I am with you. I am your God. So, and here's his plea. So, because I am your God, do not fear. Do not be dismayed. Do not fear. Time again, that plea is voiced by Isaiah throughout the book that bears his name. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 4. That, that plea was made to King Ahaz. Be careful. He didn't. Be careful. Keep calm. King Ahaz wasn't. Don't be afraid. King Ahaz was. Do not lose heart. King Ahaz did. He didn't listen. He made choices because he thought the 30 feet ahead of him was all there was. And he couldn't see the beauty of the Lord and his glory and his power and his presence. Isaiah 35 verse 4. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. Isaiah 37, verse 6. The Lord told Isaiah to tell King Hezekiah, do not be afraid of what you have heard. You see, fear wells up when we forget who God is. And it wells up when we forget who we are. We are his servants. We are his chosen. We are his offspring, his children. Like Abraham, we are his friends. So his plea, do not be dismayed. 
The, the root of the word dismayed here, it means to gaze, to look around. It pictures eyes which are darting around, first this way, then that way, darting around because of nervousness and anxiety and fear. In fact, the New American Standard version of the text here brings this out very well in this translation where it says, do not anxiously look about you. See, anxiously looking about us is a sign of fear. Think of a, of a dark room. Picture yourself in a dark room. A, a quick glance to the left, then a quick glance to the right, looking anxiously around because you don't know what's there. You're afraid you're missing something or can't see something. And you're afraid that no one's with you to cover your back. And there's that feeling of being alone and on your own. God pleads with his people, do not fear, do not be dismayed. I've got you covered. I've got your back. Circumstances can often give birth to fear and dismay. Both are instincts which arise when, when I feel rejected by God and loved by him and abandoned by him. They well up when, when we feel all alone, as though there's no one to turn to. That we have to cover our own back because there is no one else around to do so. In those moments when we feel that way, that God has abandoned us. God pleads with us not to fear or be dismayed, but to remember his abiding love. As the Apostle John says, there is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear. God loves his children so we can heed his pleads, his pleas to trust him. And we can rest assured that he has us covered and rest in the knowledge of his love. In presence. So when fear is in our, has us in its grip, we need to remember God's plea to us, but finally we need to remember God's provision for us. God's provision for his people are summarized in the latter half of verse 10. There we read, I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Again, God employs a picture to help us understand his activity in our life. He uses the picture of his right hand. That The hand, as you know in your own experience, is the organ of personal action. It is with our hands that we do things, that we accomplish things. And as Isaiah points us to God's right hand, it reminds us that God is not simply passively compassionate for us, but he is actively at work bringing his resources to bear on our behalf in time of need. And notice he will utilize his hand for our good. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you. Now call me a sentimental fool. But honestly, there are some verses of Scripture that strike differently when they're read out of the King James Version. And this is one of those verses that, for me, strikes differently than when I read it out of the ESV or the NIV. In this case, the King James Version supplies a nuance of the Hebrew that's missing in the English Standard Version, in King James Version. The, the King James reads like this, I will strengthen thee. Yay! That's not in the ESV or the NIV. I will strengthen thee. Yay! I will help thee. Yay! I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, yay is not yay! Not clapping like we did this morning. The word yay here, it means on top of that, in addition to that. And so we read that I will strengthen thee. And on top of that, I will help thee. And on top of that, 
I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. A reminder that God piles his activity upon activity upon activity on behalf of his people. Recall what John says in his Gospel, chapter 1, verse 16. From his fullness, from God's fullness, we have received what? Do you remember? Grace upon grace. I will grace thee. Yea, I will grace thee even more than you've already been graced. We sing what? All I have needed or will need, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. All that God's people need. Be God's people in the days of Isaiah or in our time. All that God's people, all that God's children need for the living of the moment and of life will be provided for them. One of the things that came into my possession some time back was a Bible, a King James Version Bible, that belonged to my great aunt, Ella Roselle, Aunt Ella. And so it was her King James Bible that I pulled off the shelf just to make sure I was remembering the King James right of Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. And so I pulled Aunt Ella's Bible off the shelf. And imagine my surprise when I turned to it and found that verse underlined... And beside the verse, which was underlined, was the date, and you can't quite see it here. It's the date of February the 8th, 1943. February the 8th, 1943, my Aunt Ella turned to the scriptures. Something prompted her to underline what was there. And then to write in the margin that day's date. Curious, I, I got out the family history and I, I figured out that she would have been 36 years old. Show me a hand. Anyone, who here is 36? Anybody here 36? Let me see your hand. Anyone here 36? Dave Berkey, you're not 36. I, <laughs> yeah, you're, wow. In the house of God. <laughs> Anyone here 36? Don't be shy. No. Maybe not. Aunt Ella was 36 years old. I began to wonder what was happening in her life that caused her to underline this verse and record that date. At 36 years of age, she wasn't married yet. She wasn't married until 1945, two years later. So maybe she was anxious about whether or not that would ever happen to her. She had also graduated from Moody Bible Institute in 1935. And she had intended... And why she went to Moody Bible Institute was to prepare for mission work to the Congo. Her dad, my great-grandfather, had been instrumental in developing what was known as the Congo Inland Mission. And he had helped been instrumental in sending missionaries to Congo. And it was Ann Ella's desire, her heart's desire, to go to Congo. But it never happened for her. So maybe she was wrestling with that news. That how she had envisioned her life was not going to happen. It, it was also that time, her, her father had died in 1926, leaving her mom a widow. And and Ella's mother's health wasn't the best, and so there's perhaps concern about what was happening in her life. 
Likewise, 1943, World War II was at full throttle. I wonder what it was that on February the 8th, 1943, she underlined this verse in her Bible and marked the date. Someday, I'll have the opportunity to ask her. But, but regardless, on, on the eighth day of February, 1943, my Aunt Ella appears to have found provision of help. That God's provision helped to calm her in a moment of fear. Because she remembered and she was reminded that her Heavenly Father would strengthen her. Yea, her Heavenly Father would help her. Yea, her Heavenly Father would uphold her with his right hand. You are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I, I don't know, is there anything weighing heavy on your heart and mind this morning? Does fear have a grip on you? God would tell you if you are his child through faith in Jesus Christ, he would look you in the eye, he would put his hands on your shoulder, and he would say, my child, you have nothing to fear. Are you entering a new school year or a new classroom with a new teacher? If you are God's child, you have nothing to fear. Are you entering into a new season of life? If you are God's child, you have nothing to fear. Are you entering unknown territory where the shadows seem awfully long and dark and the path ahead seems murky at best? If you are God's child, you have nothing to fear. Why? Because we can hear our Heavenly Father say to us, I am with you. Yay. Well, more than that, I will strengthen you. And more than that, I will help you. And more than that, I will uphold you. When fear grips us, when, when we can't see more than 30 feet out and think that we see it all, and that all, that's all there is to see, may these words settle over our heart and mind. May the promise they contain of God's abiding presence May his plea to trust him regardless of our circumstances. And may the provision of his strength and help and power of his right hand be enough to calm our hearts. To drive away fear. That we may rest in peace. Peace knowing that the God of hope will fill us with joy and peace as we trust in him so that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? Father, we need to hear those words over and over and over again. Fear not. I am with you. Father, thank you that that is the promise that you make to each and every one of your children. May that promise just seal itself within our mind and within our heart. Father, may we hear you pleading with us. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. For I am your God. And Father, may we daily lean upon the provision that you have made for us in Christ. That you will strengthen us and help us and uphold us. Father, this is our prayer. Father, for the children going through the doors of a building, Father, may they cling to the promise of your word. And Father, whatever door we may be going through, may we cling to the promise of your word. Father, this is our prayer. We ask that you would bring it about through the working of your spirit. 
in the lives and hearts of your children. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The songwriter proclaims, Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. And the songwriter pleads with God, melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away, giver of immortal gladness, fill us each and every day with the light of day. Would you stand as we sing those words together? you love those three words, victors in the midst of strife, six words, victors in the midst of strife. We are victors in the midst of strife because of the promise, of the plea, and of the provision of our Heavenly Father. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You are dismissed. Go in peace.